So our next presenter is Dr. Jonathan Haft. Dr. Haft is an adult cardiac surgeon specializing in advanced heart failure, including heart transplantation and ventricular assist devices. He served as president of the American Society of Artificial Internal Organs, currently serves as the chair of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Workforce on End-Stage Cardiopulmonary Disease, and chairs the Technology Committee for the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization. He's the medical director of the ECMO program here at U of M and currently serves as the associate section head for quality in the section of adult cardiac surgery. His clinical practice includes surgical treatment of advanced heart failure, coronary bypass grafting, heart valve repair or replacement and treatment of thoracic aortic aneurysms. Additionally, he initiated the pulmonary endarterectomy program for patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension one of the largest programs in the Midwest. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Half. Thank you, Sarah, for that uh, nice introduction. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna share screen. Look at that, it worked. Oops, good. Sarah, are you able to see my screen? Yes, I am. Good. And how long do I have to speak? 15 minutes? Up to 45. How's that? Okay, 45. It should be good. We should have time for questions. If people are chatting, I'll make note of the time here. If, if anybody has any questions and stuff, um, may, maybe, uh, I, I don't know how to work the chat and stuff, but but maybe maybe put it in the chat and then Sarah, feel free to stop me if, uh, if somebody wants to talk about something. So, so we're gonna talk about perioperative management. Um, I do have to disclose that I, um, I wasn't listening to some of the other lectures. So uh, th there may be some assumptions in here about what, what you've already been, been, uh, been taught. Uh, so again, if, if, uh, if I'm missing out on something, please stop me. So here are the, the principles of, of perioperative management uh, of patients with, with VADs. Um, there, there's, you know, management issues that are VAD related, and then there's management issues that are not VAD related. And um, I do think it's important to talk about these non-VAD related issues in this lecture, uh, be, because these are really sick patients, and, and you're never going to be successful with VAD stuff if you can't solve the non-VAD stuff. So we'll talk about this this first, and we'll basically go down it in, in a system uh, system type uh, manner. Um, so th these are obviously critically ill patients. They, they have long-standing heart failure, and and if the wheels haven't already fall up, fallen off the bus, the wheels are, are wobbling, and and so the, the, the patients are sick, and therefore the, the care is, is complex. And the important thing is that these patients really have very little reserve uh, for for setbacks, and and so you don't have opportunities uh, to address mistakes, and if you if you do, you don't have a lot of time to do it. So you really need to be thorough and meticulous. So again, going through this in a, in a system-wide uh, manner, and, and this is sort of our philosophy in managing these patients, we really want to keep sedation uh, to a minimum so that the patients are interactive and you have the opportunity for frequent neurologic assessment. And again, if there is a neurologic setback, that you have the opportunity to address it in, in a timely fashion. In, in addition, by keeping the sedation light, it does facilitate uh, ventilator uh, uh, weaning and ventilator liberation. Um, we try to avoid benzodiazepines in, in part because it's often, in, you know, the VAD population may be elderly and, and, and that contributes to delirium, but, but also um, uh, because, the, you know, with end organ dysfunction, the benzos tend to accumulate and can be hard to wean later on. So we, we prefer to use agents like propofol, fentanyl, and, and dex. Uh, you, you do want to try to, as much as possible, avoid uh, delirium. So we encourage family visitation. Obviously, COVID has been a huge problem with that. We've certainly seen a rise in, in delirium because of the inability to get visitors in with the normal frequency. Uh, and we do everything we can to try to maintain that sleep-wake cycle by keeping the shades pulled in the daytime and, and trying to uh, avoid interruption uh, at, at night. Um, you want to make sure that patients uh, have reasonable pain control, but we also have to be very sensitive to the fact that we know that narcotics uh, can be very addicting and we want to encourage liberation from these narcotics as, as soon as it's uh, possible with, with, uh, with these patients, you know, with patients that have cardiac surgery for other reasons that are on the so-called fast track pathway. Uh, uh, you know, when they go home, they rarely take narcotics, uh, but when patients are critically ill and they stay in the ICU, we tend to be a little bit I think too liberal with narcotics and then, then weaning can be a challenge later on. 
So from a respiratory standpoint, you know, you, you want to have a multidisciplinary protocol uh, for early extubation. Uh, and again, this is not specific to VADS. This is really for all cardiac surgery. And in this nice publication from, from Canada, when they look at all the factors that, that were involved in in uh, the success of getting patients early, uh, extubated early, it was really having a multidisciplinary uh, protocol for early extubation. Um, you wanna use lung protective ventilation. So this nice publication uh, from our very own Mike Mathis uh, showed that in, in cardiac surgery patients, you know, lung protective ventilation is something we think about uh, for, for ARDS management. But in fact, it's important just for regular cardiac surgery, for patients having elective cardiac surgery, that using a lung protective bundle was independently associated with freedom from respiratory related complications in the perioperative phase. Um, preoperative optimization is important. Smoking cessation, you know, when, when possible, a lot of these patients are in the hospital, uh, at, you know, preoperatively, so you don't really have the luxury of trying to get them free from cigarette smoking for months and months, which we know reduces the likelihood of uh, respiratory complica uh, complications from bronchorrhea. And then the use of the VAP bundle. Uh, these are some of the examples in the ventilator-associated pneumonia bundle, including elevation of the head of the bed, routine oral care, and, and daily assessment uh, for, uh, for uh, um, uh, weaning suitability. Uh, from a gastrointestinal perspective, you try to feed these patients as early as possible. One, because it's good for the guts, and two, because uh, many of them are malnourished from, from longstanding uh, heart failure and cardiac cachexia. Uh, the dietary services can be really helpful. The number of uh, you know, enteral formulations is changing, and, and uh, there's so many of them uh, that they can be really helpful for patients who have uh, absorptive issues, patients that have sensitivity issues. Um, uh, so stress ultra prophylaxis, so lots of evidence in the cardiac surgery population uh, that shows that the stress ultra prophylaxis uh, in the ICU is really essential. And in fact, from a VAD perspective, we, we use stress ultra prophylaxis uh, indefinitely to reduce the risk of GI bleeding uh, that we will talk about later. Um, from a VAD perspective, um, elevated bilirubin is extremely common in this population. Uh, so patients may, may have a bilirubin of 1.5 pre-op and on post-op day three, four, it may be seven. Uh, and sometimes that generates a lot of anxiety, getting ultrasounds to look for gallstones and things of that nature. But, but with longstanding uh, hepatic congestion, it's extremely common to see that rapid rise in bilirubin, and then you'll see it come down uh, over the coming days. So from a, a urinary perspective, uh, as we'll, we'll talk about in, in more detail, you really have to watch fluid balance uh, carefully. You, ideally, your patients are euvolemic going in, but again, this is, this is a critical heart failure population, and oftentimes uh, uh, you are not. Um, you know, we've all been told that diuretics can be nephrotoxic by inducing a pre-renal state, uh, but the reality is if the patients are fluid overloaded uh, and, and the, the kidneys are congested, aggressive diuresis can actually make your kidney function uh, get better. So you may find with, with, uh, with aggressive diuresis that, that the creatinine starts to fall. Um, in the ICU, we like to use diuretic infusions because, because it works. And in this nice publication, diuretic infusions randomized to bolus use of diuretics gives you more urine output and makes your heart failure get better faster. However, there is a price to be paid. Uh, it is associated with more complications down the road, including renal failure, and as shown here, rehospitalization and, and even death. So you do have to be thoughtful uh, about your aggressive diuresis. And then this seems obvious, avoid nephrotoxic agents, but you know, many times we're tempted to, to get CT scans with contrast, and, and you really do have to be very judicious about, uh, about using things that you think might be toxic to what, what are already fragile kidneys. From an infectious disease perspective, you know, we use perioperative antibiotics for the bad population in the same way that we do for, uh, for all cardiac surgery. We use vancomycin and cefiroxime for 48 hours. Uh, and then we stop them unless you, you believe the patient has an active infection. Um, we try to address any uh, infection vulnerabilities preoperatively. And, and the most common suspects are going to be uh, the teeth and the line. So we have the dental service evaluate and, and remove any, any uh, you know, potential uh, um, you know, odontogenic infections and then take out all the lines that have been in a long time uh, because we know uh, w where that ends up. Uh, leading to. Um, you want to know what your own unit's uh, antibiogram is. What germs do you typically see and what are the sensitivities of those germs so that you can initiate appropriate uh, empiric therapy in a timely fashion? 
um, having dedicated programs to reduce the frequency of uh, catheter-associated bloodstream infections and uh, catheter-associated urinary tract infections. And most of these programs are really based upon if you don't need a Foley and you don't need a line, take them out. Uh, but when you do absolutely need them, you know, having a program where you, you uh, uh, reduce the likelihood of these, these structures becoming infected is, is really super important. And then techniques to avoid, uh, you know, skin pressure injuries. You know, our own unit, uh, you know, has been plagued with skin pressure injuries and it is no fault of our excellent nurses and, and nursing leaders. It's because our unit is is unique. Many of our residents that may be on the on the call and, and nurses know that um, we, we have some patients that are long term uh, uh, players with us, patients that spend months and months in the hospital. And that's unique to other units in the hospital where patients don't spend a long time. Uh, in those units, they 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 you know either uh, get better and, and leave, or they they go to heaven, uh, or uh, they come to our unit, and then they spend months and months in our unit. And so the reality is is that the longer you spend critically ill in ICU, the more likely you are to have these 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 wound related issues. Um, but having a dedicated team to address it and, and do your best to prevent it is is super important. And then from an endocrine perspective, glycemic control. We spend a lot of time thinking about glycemic control in, in cardiac surgery. And you can see from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, it's a class one recommendation with level of evidence A and B. Uh, it's a really high quality evidence that you wanna have good glycemic control within the first 24 or 48 hours of cardiac surgery. And, and fortunately, we're very uh, proud of our uh, hyperglycemia team partners that, that help us in that regard. So let's dive now into the VAD uh, specific issues. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time talking about right ventricular dysfunction, right ventricular management. We'll also talk about tamponade, uh, arrhythmias, uh, anticoagulation, uh, blood pressure measurement and management, uh, GI bleeding, driveline related issues, uh, and lastly, this very strange uh, but, but sometimes vexing problem of outflow graft obstruction, which we hope we have solved. So the right ventricle, right ventricular failure, this is the Achilles heel of VAD therapy. It really, uh, it really is. And, uh, you know, it's all about the right ventricle, stupid. Remember the Bill Clinton campaign? It's about the economy, stupid. Uh, it's all about the right ventricle. So really, if you're, if you're looking to make a VAD program successful, you really have to educate everybody on your team. You, your, your eye has to be on that right ventricle all the time. So the right ventricle is subject to the same myopathic process as the left ventricle. All of these patients have some degree of right ventricular dysfunction. It's much more common in the non-ischemic population than the ischemic population, but it certainly can be, can be present and is present in, in both. Um, in addition, um, there's an elevation in pulmonary vascular resistance, right ventricular afterload, and that's because of chronic left heart failure. When you have long-standing left heart failure and left atrial hypertension, this leads to pulmonary vascular changes and increased pulmonary vascular resistance, and we'll talk about dealing with that uh, in a few slides. Uh, in addition, you've got an RV that's sick going to the operating room. You put an LVAD in, and now you may actually make the RV worse. You may unmask uh, RV dysfunction by putting the VAD in. The patient goes to the operating room with a cardiac index of 1.2, and then you put an LVAD in, and now the RV is expected to have a, a cardiac index that keeps pace with the mechanical uh, device on the left side, and maybe it's just incapable of producing a cardiac index of two, two and a half, three, or whatever, whatever your target is going to be. And so the, these right ventricular problems are, are, I wouldn't say ubiquitous, but something that you have to be wary of. In addition, the VAD itself can cause RV failure from septal shift. And I suspect you've had some lectures earlier today talking about speed setting and septal shift and RV dysfunction, but we'll talk about it again because it really is super important. And when you talk about the right ventricle, we're really talking about um, you know, the physiology of preload, afterload, and contractility. And so we'll dive into those individually. So in terms of preload, you know, we measure RV preload with with the, by measuring the CVP or right atrial pressure. And it's actually a very mediocre assessment uh, of RV filling. Uh, you're measuring the pressure in the venous system. And the venous system is a capacitance system, right? So you can have a CVP of five and have a venous system this big, and you can have a CVP of five and have a venous system that is that big. So it doesn't necessarily tell you if you have adequate RV filling. What it does tell you is if you have RV overload. If your CVP is 25, your capacitance is not this big. It's gonna be this big or bigger. So, so it tends to be binary. You're either overloaded or you're not sure where you are. So it's not the best assessment tool. You have to rely on other assessment tools for RV filling. Um, 
But the RV is, is very different than the LV. It's very, very sensitive to, to preload. So if you look at RV anatomy uh, in, this, in this cartoon here, you can see the RV is a crescent, like this beautiful crescent moon here. And the RV likes to be a crescent, um, unlike the LV, which is more of a cylinder. The LV, based on Starling's law, gets better when it gets full until it falls over the edge at the very late stage. Whereas the RV, uh, the startling curve is very, very short. In other words, it's very easy to overload uh, that RV. So you have to be very sensitive to volume status. So di diuretics are really the mainstay uh, of managing RV dysfunction in the post-operative setting. Um, so uh, we, we think about transfusions. Uh, you know, there are some cardiac surgery populations where it's not uncommon to have lots of perioperative transfusions, you know, the, the aortic and especially the type A dissection population, but we really try not to be that way with the VAD population. We want to be very uh, meticulous because you don't want to overload uh, with the fluid that comes with transfusions. We don't want to cause pulmonary hypertension from lung injury of transfusions like, like trolley or transfusion associated lung injury. So we are very, very meticulous with hemostasis. We'd like these patients to come out dry, Pagani dry, as we like to call it here at the University of Michigan. Um, sometimes rapid pacing can be very helpful. Rapid pacing, uh, uh, obviously, by, by making the heartbeat faster, it's less time for ventricular filling, which means that right ventricle doesn't have as much time uh, to, to fill up. So, so we want the heart rate to be a little faster if you're specifically worried about the RV. Uh, we think about the tricuspid valve. Um, tricuspid regurgitation and management of in the VAD world remains somewhat controversial, and there are people that are firmly entrenched in their camps. About half of the centers say you don't need to address the tricuspid. About half the centers, uh, including ours, tend to be fairly liberal. So I think we're about 35, 40 percent of our patients will have a simultaneous tricuspid valve repair. And, and the reason is because tricuspid regurgitation is a volume overload lesion. It's going to exacerbate RV dysfunction and RV overload uh, in that early perioperative phase. So we have the philosophy of you know, fixing it because it's fairly easy to do. So moving on to afterload of the RV. So as I mentioned earlier, these patients do have elevated pulmonary vascular resistance related to longstanding left heart failure, longstanding left atrial hypertension. Some of that pulmonary hypertension is fixed. It's fixed and unresponsive because you have pulmonary vascular changes, vasculopathy, you have medial hypertrophy of the arterial. Sometimes you develop these plexiform lesions, which are partial obstruction of the pulmonary vasculature. And again, it will not respond. Uh, but sometimes you have pulmonary hypertension that is responsive and that can help you, but it can also hurt you uh, if it responds in a negative way. So you can have pulmonary vasoconstriction responsiveness from things like hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis, uh, pulmonary edema, and high PEEP. Um, are those things that ever happen in our ICU? Yeah, like all the time. And so you really need to think about these. So you have to avoid hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis, uh, avoid uh, overloading these lungs and avoid uh, excessive PEEP. You have to be very thoughtful about ventilator weaning. And, you know, in the ICU setting for cardiac surgery, we are talked, we talk about fast track and activate and get these people extubated as soon as possible. And we are certainly fully supportive of that. However, in the VAD population, you have to be very, very thoughtful. So, you know, a little bit of acidosis and hypoxia and hypercarbia in, say, you know, a healthy mitral valve patient is tolerated perfectly fine, not in an LVAD patient. Because if you get pulmonary vasoconstriction, an increase in PBR, that might make an RV that's just barely making it into an RV that is failing. Um, so the good thing about responsiveness of the pulmonary vasculature uh, is that you can treat it. You can treat it with pulmonary vasodilators. And there's a variety of types of pulmonary vasodilators. There's systemic pulmonary vasodilators, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors like milrinone, uh, and then there's inhaled pulmonary vasodilators like inhaled nitric oxide and inhaled uh, epoprosinol or valetri. And if you look at this cartoon, uh, what, what the point of this is, is, is that these different pulmonary vasodilators work through different pathways and different mechanisms. So they can actually be synergistic with each other. Sometimes you can use more than one of these agents uh, and get an even more effective response. I just want to talk a little bit about um, uh, inhaled uh, pulmonary vasodilators like inhaled nitric and inhaled valetri. Um, so this was a recent uh, uh, randomized trial of valetri versus uh, inhaled nitric oxide. And what this trial shows is that the endpoints are exactly the same. The two drugs seem to be equally effective. The only thing that's different is right down here is the cost, that there's massive cost difference. Elytri is much less expensive than inhaled uh, nitric is. And so our institution has largely shifted from nitric to elytri. 
Um, in addition, uh, when you give people nitric, um, you stop making your own nitric. All of our blood vessels make nitric oxide, a lot of it. Uh, and when you give somebody exogenous nitric oxide, you stop making it. And so when you wean nitric, uh, you tend to get this rebound pulmonary hypertension because the blood vessels no longer have nitric because they've been seeing nitric and it takes a while until they start making their own nitric. And so the therapeutic window for nitric tends to be at that very last step. You know, we tend to, to run it at 20 parts per million. And as we wean it, you know, you, you wean from 20 down to 10 to five uh, and down to two. And, you know, you pat yourself on the back saying, I'm doing so good weaning the nitric, but it usually doesn't make a difference until you get down to that nitric of one. And when you go from one to off, that's the big step. And that's when you start to see that rebound pulmonary hypertension. So the key, and we try to educate our residents uh, uh, and, and advanced practice providers in the unit, you wean it based upon parameters of RV performance. What is the LVAD flow? In other words, how much blood is being delivered to the left ventricle by that right ventricle? What is the CVP? Is the, is the right ventricle congested? What are your vasoconstrictor needs telling you your overall hemodynamic status? These are the things you wanna look at as you wean that nitric off, not the PA pressures, because you frequently will see that rebound effect and oftentimes people will panic and turn the nitric back on and, and, and uh, it makes it hard to wean it off. And here, here's a photo of a friend of mine, uh, Vince Pellegrino. He's an intensivist from uh, a Melbourne, Australia, the St. Vincent program, a huge program. He came to visit us a few years ago uh, and he had a great line. He said, you know, the thing about nitric is that it doesn't always help you, but it always hurts when you wean it uh, off. And so you should be very thoughtful about whether you're gonna use nitric or not. What's interesting is that rebound effect does not exist with Velitri. So we find it's much easier to wean patients off Velitri than it is with nitric, probably because of that negative feedback uh, process uh, with exogenous NO. So lastly, we're gonna talk about RV contractility. Um, so uh, uh, the, again, the RV is dysfunctional going in because of that inherent myopathic process. And then it is exacerbated in the, uh, in the perioperative period for a variety of reasons. One is because of hypotension. So uh, any of the surgical residents in the room know that uh, the RV loves to have blood pressure. That even in a non-VAD case, you do a cabbage or an aortic valve or something, if the patient gets hypotensive in the operating room, instantly you see the RV starts to get a little poopy. And when you give blood pressure, when you give a vasoconstrictor, even though it's not, a, it's not an inotrope, you'll see that RV will start to get snappier uh, because again, it likes blood pressure. And so if you have perioperative hypotension, which is very common uh, in the VAD population, uh, you'll see RV dysfunction. Um, just a little bit about vasopressin versus norepinephrine. These are the two vasoconstrictors that we use fairly ubiquitously in, in our ICU for all patients, but especially bad. So vasopressin has these theoretical advantages. Uh, there are no vasopressin receptors in your lungs, so you will not get any vaso, uh, vasoconstriction uh, in the pulmonary vascular bed, which is important. Um, there are no, um, uh, uh, vasopressin does not uh, uh, have any affinity for beta receptors. So for people that are having arrhythmias, a vasopressin may be a better agent. Uh, and then vasopressin tends to preferentially constrict the efferent arterial of the kidney. And so you, you may get more GFR with vasopressin than you do with norepinephrine. That being said, there has never been a prospective randomized trial that shows that vasopressin is more effective than norepinephrine. And the fact is, is that it's 15 times more expensive uh, as an agent. So, so uh, I, I tend to avoid using vasopressin but we still use a lot of it in our ICU. So anyways, for any of our team members, I would encourage you to try to use norepinephrine first. And if you find that you're having issues with pulmonary hypertension, RV dysfunction, arrhythmias, then, then switch to vasopressin. Uh, acidosis can exacerbate RV dysfunction in the perioperative uh, period because you become less, uh, uh, you have lower affinity for your, for your catecholamines. Um, you know, RV does respond to, to inotropes, and, and we use a variety of different types of inotropes, uh, mainly the phosphodiesterase inhibitors and catecholamines, which you can see uh, in terms of the effect of these agents. They work in different pathways, means, uh, which means they can be uh, synergistic with each other. One comment about the catecholamines is that people that have longstanding heart failure, they tend to have down regulation of their beta receptors, which means um, that they're very sensitive to it. Uh, and so we wean it very, very slowly. And the nurses will make fun of me uh, in the ICU because I take the dobutamine from, from three down to two and a half, or maybe two, that's at most. Um, you know, I just go very, very slow with it because again, my feeling is that these right ventricles can be very, very sensitive uh, to, to uh, catecholamine weaning. So be very thoughtful, patient. Um, 
preoperative evaluation of the RV is, is super important. I don't know if uh, any of the pre previous speakers have, have talked about it. Maybe I'll, if they have, we'll go quick here. So, you know, we get an echocardiogram and, and you have a look at the RV. And so here's an echo. Uh, it, 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 I promise you it's playing, but you can't tell it's playing because the EF is so bad. But you see this, this person has clearly terrible uh, biventricular dysfunction. So you're looking at the function of the RV, you're looking at TAPSI, the tricuspid annular excursion, which is this right here, the bounce of the, the tricuspid annulus. And in this case, they're both really, really bad. Uh, in addition to the echo, and we'll turn that off. Uh, in addition to looking at the echo, we look at the hemodynamics. Uh, there's a variety of hemodynamic parameters that we look at, including uh, RV stroke work index. We look at the, P, the PAPI, the pulmonary artery pulsatility index. We look at the ratio of CVP and wedge. Um, none of these are perfect, but they are helpful. Uh, you can look at other imaging uh, related assessments of RV function, uh, like nuclear tests, MUGA, uh, MRIs. Uh, you can look at clinical factors that can be very important, like uh, what is end organ function, uh, renal dysfunction, kidney dis uh, uh, hepatic dysfunction. Uh, is the patient on a mechanical ventilator? Uh, is the patient on vasoconstrictors? And then from a global perspective, what is the intermax level? Hopefully you did talk about intermax level. Uh, that's sort of this... Uh, you know, somewhat subjective assessment of a patient's acuity, and the worse the intermax level, the more likely you are to have RV dysfunction issues. Um, and then there's an opportunity preoperatively to try to optimize that RV with fluid management, with diuresis, and sometimes temporary MCS. We don't think of temporary mechanical support as being a way to reduce uh, the need for RVAD, but I, I, I think it does. I think some people, you put a balloon pump in, and that terrible RV uh, performs a little bit better, likely because you've unloaded the LV uh, to a certain degree. It's a paper not too long ago looking at the variety of scoring systems that are used to assess RV function. Uh, and what I show, what I'll show you here is that, um, whoops, uh, sorry. The last one here is the, ah, the Michigan score, the Michigan RV risk score. That's a, uh, a head nod to uh, um, uh, Jennifer Cowger, who's a cardiologist at Henry Ford. She used to be uh, uh, with us. She was a fellow here and faculty here. And she came up with the scoring model to predict RV dysfunction, which was based on RV performance, but also based on end organ function. And it continues to be one of the highest performing preoperative predictors of RV failure. So speed setting, I think you've probably already talked a lot about speed setting and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it because it's super, super important. And it's not, it's not easy to do. So when we think about the, the ventricular, the, the, when we think about what speed to set in the operating room, there's a number of things we look at. And one is ventricular size and ventricular shape. So I'm looking at the four chamber view in the heart of the left ventricle. It's like, you remember that movie, The Da Vinci Code, The Chalice? So the ventricle, I want it to look like a chalice. I want it to look this way, full. You don't want it to look like this because that means you're spinning too, too fast. So, so I'm looking uh, at, from a geometric perspective, what does the ventricle look like? And where is the interventricular septum? Is it starting to get pulled over uh, because you're, you're, you're literally sucking on it with the VAD? We look at the hemodynamics. So uh, uh, how well are we supporting the patient? Do we have adequate cardiac output? And are the PA pressures unloaded uh, in our current speed setting? We look at the degree of functional mitral regurgitation. So about half of our patients have moderate or worse functional mitral regurgitation. And functional MR is not a, is not a mitral problem, it's a ventricular problem. And so if you, if you have a ventricle that is not sufficiently unloaded, you may still have moderate to severe MR. And coming out of the operating room, we wanna have uh, mild or less MR. We look at opening of the aortic valve. Um, is, is the aortic valve opening with every beat? Uh, if it is, you probably should turn your speed up a little bit. Uh, if the aortic valve is closed, it doesn't necessarily mean you're overspinning the patient, um, but, but certainly if it's opening on every beat, uh, then, then you're probably underspinning the patient. Um, they say you kind of want the aortic valve to be opening maybe every two or three beats. I don't think that's necessarily true. Some patients, the aortic valve will never open, and that's just what you have to live with if the ventricular function is really poor. Sarah, I see your image has appeared. Is that because I'm running out of time? Nope. There's a question in the chat. Oh, good. So if the patient is on high dose of norepinephrine, what will be the trigger point for starting vasopressin by the condition that other interventions have been exhausted to maintain acceptable perfusing BP? Uh, isn't that a good question? Yeah. So, so um, I mean, what, what the guidelines that we put in the ICU is a norepinephrine dose of 0 0.1. 
When you get to 0.1, then you should start vasopressin. And if you're less than 0.1, then you should start weaning the vasopressin. So those are the guidelines we put in, but you know, guidelines are not <laughs> always meant to be followed. Um, anyways, be, be thoughtful about it, but, um, but 0.1 is, is what we put together as our guideline. If your norepi is at 0.1, start some beta. Uh, does that answer the question? We'll assume it is. So uh, let's see. So we talked about aortic valve opening. Um, this is important too with, with your speed setting. So you set the speed in the operating room, right? And, and um, the speed we set again is based on all of the th these things that we just looked at. And what are all those things gonna look like tomorrow and the next day? And I can guarantee you different, right? Because the patient is in this sort of uh, very dynamic uh, uh, clinical state. Um, and so um, in, in general, in general, people tend to set the speed lower in the early phase um, because the consequences of overspinning a patient and causing that septal shift and, and, and RV dysfunction is much greater than underspinning a patient. So in the momentum trial, the average pump speed was between 5,000 uh, 5, and 5,200. Uh, at the time of implant. But then at the time of discharge, the average pump speed was a little bit higher, 5,200 to 5,400. Um, and after discharge, there was very little change in pump speed. So for the most part, there's not a lot of fussing with pump speed, but if you are tempted to fuss with the pump speed, get an echo. <laughs> so you really wanna look at what that ventricle is doing uh, before you, you, you play with the pump speed. And many times we do a formal ramp study uh, where using echo, we, we turn the VAD down until the aortic valve is opening with every beat, and then we incrementally increase the pump speed until the aortic valve remains closed, and we start to see that septum pull over. Uh, that's the maximum speed, and then when the aortic valve is opening is the minimum speed, and then the sweet spot speed is going to be somewhere, uh, somewhere in between. Hopefully, we talked about the RAM study there. These are old echoes. I'm sorry I didn't have any new ones, but this is actually with the HeartMate 2, uh, the pump that we don't use anymore. But, but the idea here is this is the ventricle. This is a surface echo, obviously. And you can see the ventricle looks nice and full. We're not overspinning the patient. And in this next picture here, um, look at that septum. That septum is getting yanked over there. And, and then in the most extreme case of it here, we're really pulling that septum over. You are gonna cause ventricular suction. This will cause right ventricular dysfunction for sure. So that's just an example of, uh, from an imaging standpoint, what we use to guide us. Check our time here. I think we're still doing okay. So right ventricular failure. So when, when, when the RV has thrown in the towel, um, you have inability to maintain an adequate LVAD flow despite what you believe is an appropriate speed setting for that patient. And the moral of the story here is if you're thinking about an RVAD, you should probably do an RVAD, that you don't wanna wait um, until it's too late. It's much better to put an RVAD in early than to use it as a rescue strategy. Um, we, we know that for, this is an old paper uh, from, from the group at Penn, uh, but it shows you that bivad is a rescue. Uh, delayed bivad is much worse than early primary bivad uh, implantation. So in terms of overall outcomes. So again, if you're going to do it, you got to do it soon. When we put in an RVAD, uh, this is a very old picture. This is an old Thoratec PVAD that doesn't exist anymore. But we typically uh, put a cannula in the right atrium for drainage, uh, a cannula or graft onto the PA for infusion. And then these things are connected to some type of VAD. And now we use the Centromag as a short-term RVAD. There's a variety of pumps that can be used for this purpose, but uh, we tend to use the, the Centromag. Um, there's a variety of approaches to it. This is just a photo of a patient uh, that we did it for. This is a patient that... Uh, that needed bivad support. We did it a priori uh, because we knew he was going to need it. We didn't want to struggle. And so what, what I'm showing you here is that we did a sternotomy, but then made little tiny thoracotomies uh, for um, facilitated explants. So here's the photo of the patient afterwards, the x-ray. You can see the heart made three pump there. There's a drainage cannula in the right atrium. There's an infusion cannula going into the pulmonary artery, but these grafts were tunneled out uh, through these little mini thoracotomies. So when the patient was ready for weaning, we were actually able to do it uh, with just a little bit of local sedation and uh, uh, I mean, a local anesthesia and sedation. So we didn't have to reintubate the patient. Uh, we, we could have done it at the bedside. We did it in the operating room, but I think the next time we'll do it at the bedside because it's really easy to do. You just open these little subcutaneous wounds and tie off the graft and pull the cannula out. Um, so it can be done in a less invasive way. The least invasive way is this percutaneous device. This is the Protec Duo cannula. It goes in through the neck and you advance it uh, through the tricuspid and pulmonary valves like a swan. And the drainage port's in the right atrium. The infusion is in the PA. And this way you can have RVAD support that is entirely percutaneous. And when it's time to wean the patient, you literally just pull it out 
and 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 put a band-aid over the exit site so it really is convenient we've done this successfully on a, a number of occasions so when do you wean the rvad if you need an rvad and and the answer is you do it when the patient is at their best right you want to do it when they are really uh doing great you want them to be extubated. You want their chest x-ray to look nice and clear. This is all the sign that the pulmonary vascular resistance is going to be as low as it's ever going to get. Um, we want to make sure that they are fluid balanced. Don't take that RVAD out if the patient is still, uh, you know, giant and, and fluid overloaded. And, and don't do it while the kidneys and liver are still, you know, shaking it off. Uh, if you do it when the, the kidney function is marginal, you take the RVAD out and now those marginal kidneys are exposed to some RV dysfunction, uh, those kidneys uh, are at risk of, of checking out. So wait till those things have come to resolution, uh, wait for vasoplegia to resolve and so forth. For us, the average time of uh, RVAD uh, until explant is, it tends to be around 14 days. So next we're gonna talk about tamponade. Tamponade, this is the thing uh, that we always fear the most, or maybe it's the thing we fear tied with some of these other things here, right? Uh, but why, why do we fear tamponade uh, the most? Um, well, it's common. So bleeding in the VAD population is very common. Many of our VAD implants are re-operations. It's about 40% in, in the University of Michigan experience. Uh, a lot of these patients have coagulopathy from, from heart failure. Uh, they have long-standing hepatic congestion. They are malnourished. Maybe they were taking medications, uh, platelet uh, inhibitors, uh, other anticoagulants that uh, will predispose to bleeding. Uh, but also the VAD itself induces the bleeding diathesis. Uh, the VAD causes platelet dysfunction. Uh, there may be fibrinolysis from plasminogen activation in the early phase. And so all of that promotes bleeding. And then, oh, by the way, we anticoagulate these patients. So that combination really makes you ripe uh, for bleeding issues. And, and, and the reason we fear tamponade is because um, it's hard to diagnose. The symptoms of tamponade are almost identical uh, to the symptoms of RV failure that I, I, I showed right here. And, and so, and the delay in treatment is always fatal. The only treatment for tamponade is to go back to the operating room. And, and, and you know, Frank Pagani has taught me many, many things in, in my career, but I think probably the most important thing he has taught me is make the diagnosis in the OR. Do not fiddle around in the ICU, wringing your hands at the bedside. Take him to the operating room and make the diagnosis. You will never regret having a look under the hood and being wrong, because if it's RV failure, you can take care of that while you're in the operating room. So I, 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 I've learned that from Frank and I've learned it from, from my own mistakes. Um, the other thing is delayed sternal closure. So, you know, we mentioned that perioperative bleeding is common and we learned many years ago that you, you can get away with not closing the chest. In fact, our very own Tracy Roman wrote the classic paper uh, that you can leave the chest open and close it later uh, without, um, uh, without having an increased risk of infectious complications. Uh, arrhythmias, uh, arrhythmias we see a lot in the VAD population. And the reason is because we see it a lot in the heart failure population. You know, ventricular arrhythmias are very common. Now, uh, oftentimes, most of the time, uh, arrhythmias get better after the VAD implant. And, and the reason they get better is because uh, a lot of the reason they have arrhythmias is because of heart failure, because of LV distension. When you put the VAD in and you eliminate heart failure, you eliminate LV distension, oftentimes you eliminate uh, the reason they were having uh, arrhythmias in the first place. Um, However, it doesn't eliminate them, it just reduces them. And so when you do have arrhythmias, you have to think of a number of things. Number one is maybe the patient is just arrhythmogenic. Some of them continue to have that arrhythmogenic substrate that was not necessarily distension mediated. Um, it may be electrolyte imbalance if you're aggressively diuresing these patients. Uh, it may be offending agents, catecholamines. Now, I, I, I don't understand this, but um, it seems to me like a lot of these patients have a lot of arrhythmias before they're, they're VAD and our cardiologists are very reluctant to start them on inotropes, but we come off pump with the VAD in on epinephrine and dobutamine, dopamine, milrinone, and we don't seem to see the same arrhythmias. But anecdotally, I have found that I see more arrhythmias when I wean the catecholamines off than we're on the, uh, the catecholamines in the, in, the, uh, in the ICU. So I, I'd be curious if Somebody could explain that to me why we see more arrhythmias when the catecholamines go away than when they're on. Another major, major factor is, is the pump. Uh, are you having suction events that are causing uh, arrhythmias? And that's the chicken and the egg. You know, a lot of times these patients will have VT and be having suction events. And, and so is the VT causing RV dysfunction leading to L low LV filling and a suction event? Or is it the other way around that you had a suction event, the suction event, caused uh, the pump to touch the septum and that precipitated VT. 
sometimes we never know the answer to it, but, but, uh, uh, but they're, they're both possible. Uh, how do you manage arrhythmias in the VAD population? So one of the first things I would suggest is you get an echo. If you're having recurring VT, get an echo and see what your ventricle looks like. If you're having suction, the first thing you got to do is turn the pump down and eliminate the suction. Um, weaning the offending agents. Again, if you're having a lot of arrhythmias and you're on uh, inotropes, then, then wean the inotropes. They may be a, a, a factor. Uh, and then the use of antiarrhythmics. Uh, amiodarone, we use it like water. Uh, lidocaine, I didn't mention beta blockers, but you know, obviously beta blockers are one of the mainstay treatments for uh, ventricular arrhythmias in, in heart failure patients. Defibrillators. Uh, almost all these patients already have a defibrillator. Notice I put the question mark there. Uh, there are some centers, uh, maybe a little controversially, but some centers that turn the defibrillator off in the LVAD patient. So you think, well, that seems crazy. Um, so if you have heart failure and, and um, you don't have a defibrillator, if you have VT, then you die. That's why we put defibrillators in, right? To shock you and get you out of it. But if you have a VAD, you generally don't die because you still have a VAD that's maintaining some circulation. You have RV dysfunction and you don't feel good, uh, but you don't die. And so a lot of centers will turn the VAD off and then when the patient doesn't feel well and their VAD flows are low, they come in the hospital, you diagnose VT, and now you can sedate them before you shock them, as opposed to having a patient get you know, shocked at home, uh, causing some of the issues that, uh, that, that come with the PTSD and so forth from repeated shocks. Um, and then we have some patients that have recurring ongoing VT issues on VAD, and it's not because of any of these you know, correctable issues. And so, um, uh, the, these patients oftentimes require ablation by our colleagues in electrophysiology. So let's talk about anticoagulation. I think I still have a little bit of time with time left over for questions. Um, so these pumps require anticoagulation. The targets are INR of uh, two to three with warfarin uh, and a baby aspirin. This is what the IFU uh, from Abbott says to do with the HeartMate 3, which is to start uh, heparin right away as soon as the bleeding stops. Um, I, I personally don't. Um, I, I just put them on sub-Q heparin and Coumadin and let it drift up. I feel confident in, in the hemocompatibility of the HeartMate 3, but my partner, Frank Pagani, he does like to bridge uh, with, with heparin, uh, lower dose uh, heparin infusions, but, but uh, I, I think there's, there's a variety of strategies out there. But the IFU from, from Abbott says start them on IV heparin and bridge that way. Talk a little bit about GI bleeding. Uh, 20 to 30% of patients with these continuous flow, pu uh, flow pumps have GI bleeding. Uh, it's, a, it's a multifactorial reason uh, for it. One is that you tend to get these angiodysplasias of the gut, of the small intestine, related to the non pulsatile flow. And you couple that with platelet dysfunction associated with the VAD itself. And it's presumably from destruction of high uh, molecular weight uh, von Willebrand multimers from the shear forces of the pump. You put those th two things together with Coumadin and you get GI bleeding. And the treatment for it is to scope them, well, reverse their anticoagulation first, uh, and then to scope them. And oftentimes it requires uh, a, a unique type of endoscopy with double balloon enteroscopy to get into the small intestine. Oftentimes it is treatable with a skilled endoscopist, uh, but it does require some advanced techniques. Sometimes we use these somatostatin analogs to reduce GI bleeding rates. Uh, and, and many times with recurring GI bleeding, we just lower their INR uh, or their anticoagulation targets, elimination of aspirin or a lowering their INR goal. Blood pressure management is important. So these non-pulsatile VADs uh, is very difficult to measure blood pressure with your normal uh, automated blood pressure cuffs. So you may have to do it old school using a, a sphingomanometer uh, and a Doppler. And, and what you get is a mean arterial pressure. We target a mean arterial pressure of less than 90, 70 to 90 is usually our goal. Um, hypotension in the early uh, period is very, very common for a variety of reasons. There's this you know, vasopressin deficiency that comes with heart failure. Medications cause a, a vasoplegia. Um, and then uh, hypotension has to be treated because these pumps are afterload sensitive. And if you become hypotensive, the pump will empty out the ventricle and you'll start having suction events. And so you do want to maintain that mean arterial pressure in the 70s uh, or 80s. But you don't want to have mean arterial pressures higher than 90. Again, by being afterload sensitive, you'll have lower pump flow. And it has been shown with these non pulsatile pumps uh, that a mean arterial pressure greater than 90 is associated with a higher risk of stroke. So if you do have this consistently treated uh, with a variety of different agents. Driveline infection used to be the Achilles heel of VAD therapy, but I don't think it is. It's, it's a problem, but it's more of a nuisance problem rather than really something that, that leads to, 
to death. But there's a lot of techniques that go into uh, reducing the likelihood of it. Uh, the, the silicone to skin interface, I think every bad surgeon knows this now. You don't want that textured surface to be on the outside. You want it to be buried uh, on the inside for tissue ingrowth. We use a training stitch to try to maintain immobility. Uh, we irrigate our wound typically with antiseptics like uh, chlorpactin or Dakin solutions like bleach. Uh, limit OR traffic, uh, which we're not always successful at here at a teaching hospital. And then really good care of the drive. And this is the most important thing, is taking good care of the site. You want to keep it immobilized uh, and you want to use good sterile technique when changing the dressing. And so it really does come down to education of the the patients. And we have some patients that are a decade out, never had a driveline infection. And then some people just have them over and over and over again. And I think it really is about how they take care of it and take care of themselves. When you have an infection, what do you do about it? We put them on antibiotics and just suppress it forever and ever and ever. Obviously, there's drawbacks of being on uh, uh, antibiotics forever. Sometimes we do local surgical wound debridement. Sometimes we do fancy reciting of it, uh, putting the driveline in the abdomen and covering it with omentum. It buys you time. It doesn't cure the infection. Uh, you can do a total pump exchange. We, we have had total cures by doing that, but, but obviously it's a big operation. It's an expensive uh, intervention as well. And then the best treatment of all is just get rid of the pump uh, and, and transplant them for those that are eligible. So outflow graft obstruction, very unusual problem. We found this early in the momentum trial. In fact, I think it was my patient that was the very first patient in the momentum trial that had a twist. And sadly, I think it was also my patient that was the second patient to have a twist. So I was really sad and, and uh, I guess selfishly was delighted when I found out that lots of other people started having it too. So it wasn't just me, but, but basically the, the original pump had a swivel that could turn uh, the outflow graft. And it was designed that way on purpose so that you could do the outflow graft first, connect it to the pump, and then it turned the swivel so that the graft was straight. And what they were finding for reasons that remain unclear uh, was that like years later, these things were swiveling and twisting and causing an obstruction. And the only treatment for it is to go to the operating room and, and fix it, replace the graft. Uh, and, and now the problem is solved because they've eliminated the swivel. So this is now a historical problem. But this problem is not. This is a outflow graft obstruction related to extrinsic compression, uh, showing that um, in, in the space between the graft and the bend relief, the bend relief is designed for two reasons. One is to prevent kinking, but two is, is it protects the graft just under the xiphoid when you saw back in for the transplant or for any other reason, you have to go back into the chest. It protects you from sawing into the graft. You, you, the, the bend relief uh, is, is rigid. You can't saw through it, but it's a space. It's a space that allows accumulation of uh, you know, biologic proteinaceous material that will compress the graft. And so we think we have this problem solved by basically cutting holes or venting uh, the bend relief to allow uh, uh, removal of that stuff. Uh, preparation for discharge. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to talk about it because uh, I think we're nearing the end. Um, but uh, basically, it's a multidisciplinary uh, uh, endeavor uh, to be sure that these patients are educated, they are confident, they are competent uh, and, and ready to go home. And we, we rely on uh, our VAD team and edu educators of the VAD team. We rely on occupational therapists, physical therapists, our nursing staff uh, to be sure it can be done safely. And, and having uh, discharged, you know, a thousand patients, I believe now with VADs. Uh, uh, we, 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 we feel like we, we, we do it very well. So I'm, I'm grateful to my team for doing it. So in summary, care requires a, mo a robust multidisciplinary team. Attention to detail is essential because these patients don't have reserve. It's all about the right ventricle. Um, early recognition and, and, and treatment of complications is really essential. And, and the fact is, is that long-term bad survival is now routine. We used to high five each other when you got two years on a VAD patient. And now, you know, four or five years is routine. So it's great things, great stuff. Anyways, if you have questions, uh, you know, if you work here, call me anytime. And if you don't work here, look me on the Google and call me anytime. Thank you.